And I'm excited. Week six, our last uh, installment of our identity series, really answering the question, who are you when culture shifts? Man, it's changing. And what used to be in is now out. What used to be true is now false. And we looked at last week even that right and wrong even changes in our society and the matters of a week, and if you missed last week, I highly encourage you to go back and watch it. I think it's one of the, the best messages that, that we've preached from our platform, and I really think it really brings the series together. If you missed any of the weeks, I really think this series has been uh, just a game changer for our church. You know, week one, we talked about that culture, it's shifting, and culture, it wants to rename us. And we studied the, the young uh, uh, Jewish boys that were, were, were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and, and culture was shifting for them. And the first thing that King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do was rename them, to tame them, and then to claim them. But that we can be founded, we can find our identity in Christ and not what the world says about us. And then week two, we, we learned that, that, that the enemy, Satan, is really jealous of us because we stole his job, that he was the worship leader and that now there's a fight over our worship. There's a fight over who we are going to put on the throne of our life. Will it be culture or will it be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And then week three, we, we talked about some end times of insanity, that the world is insane, that it's crazy, and that, that we defeat the crazy by pulling ourselves out of the situation, that pride is the root of all sins, and when we make it about us, it will be about us, and failure is on its way, that we've gotta, we've gotta glorify and exalt Jesus over every situation. And week four, Pastor Tyler did a great job talking about the handwriting on the wall, that our time is short, and that eternity is coming. We need to live differently. And then last week, we studied the life of Daniel and Daniel 6 and some statements that were made about him, that he lived his life above reproach and that he was in culture, but he was not of culture. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. And he was able to lead at a high level in at least three different world empires under, under Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and Cyrus. And under three different leaders, he was able to lead because he had some exceptional qualities. And we studied those last week, what it looks like to stand out in a culture of compromise. There's a fight worth fighting, but we're all too often fighting the wrong fights. And today I wanna wrap it all up and really summarize the last six chapters of Daniel. See, the first six are giving us really Daniel's credentials, Daniel's life story, and we took a lot of application. The last six chapters are all about end times, their dreams and their prophecies, and they're, they're, they're giving clarification of those dreams and prophecies. And I just want you to know, I started out this, uh, this week looking to give you a 35 to 40 minute overview of the end times. I got about two hours in and thought, there is no way. <laughs> that was gonna be a three hour sermon. And I know we're really good around here, you like it, but nobody wants to listen to me for three hours. Like my wife doesn't even wanna hang out with me for three hours. Like date night's an hour because there's only so much of me you can take, I get it, I get it. So we shortened it, we got rid of it, we're gonna do it at a later date. We're gonna come back and study the end times. What I wanna do is go to 1 Thessalonians today, chapter four and five and really give you what I think is the most important thing when it comes to the end times. The question is, are we living in the last days? Are we living in the end times? Or are we getting closer? The truth is yes, we are all getting closer to the end times, or at least your end of time. Like you're gonna die at some point. Like could you be more positive, just the unpositive? Like you're, gonna, you're, you're closer today than you were yesterday to your end of days, like the end times are coming. Are we in the last days? No, but you're in your last days and they're counting down. <laughs> Some of you closer than others, you know what I mean? You're just, you're one step closer to heaven, come on. Oh. <laughs> We're living in the end times and what do you need to know? Lot of different theories out there, lot of different opinions, lot of conjecture in the church. What you need to know is that Jesus lived for you, the perfect life, died as you, like took your sins, took your insecurity, took your mistakes, rose again three days later, then he walked around just scaring people for about 40 days, just in his glorified body, popping through walls, and then, I just feel like Jesus has a little bit of sarcasm. I can't wait, I hope I get there before the end of times, because I'd like to sit by Jesus and just make fun of some people. I think that's happening up there. He's like, hey, look at this guy. <laughs> he doesn't even know. We're gonna rescue him later, but let's just watch him for a little bit. Like I just, <laughs> that could happen, that may not be in there. So he then, after four days, he ascended to heaven. The Bible says right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding on our behalf. 
And I just love that we have a savior that doesn't spectate, that he doesn't say, I think I know what that feels like, that the Bible says we have a high priest that has gone through everything that we could ever go through. And he understands the abuse, the rejection, the insecurity, defeating temptation, he's gone through all of it. And then it says clearly all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament prophecy that Jesus one day is gonna return. Like Jesus is coming back. What do you need to know about the end times is Jesus is coming back and one day we're gonna be held accountable for how we live this life. And if you get nothing else out of today, I need you to hear there is more to this life than just this life. That, that eternity is coming. Jesus is coming back and it should change the way that we live. If we're gonna uh, study this together, if you got your Bibles, you can go to 1 Thessalonians chapter four. 1 Thessalonians chapter four. Paul writing this letter to the church there and uh, we get some things about Jesus' return that I want to just practically pull out of Scripture. Even in the book of prophecy, even in studying complex things, I believe the Bible is applicable to our life today. And so let's look at verse 15 through 18 and discuss this for a few moments. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive will be left until the coming of the Lord. We will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. We're gonna come back to that in just a moment, but I wanna highlight it here while it's on the screen. You need to know if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you've confessed him as Lord and Savior, there is nothing that can separate you from that. You're always gonna be with him. I read that this week and just felt this security of knowing that, that now that I've given my life to Jesus, that I'm always going to be with him. Regardless of what happens in my life, I have access to a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's so powerful. Then let's finish it out, verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words, that Jesus is coming again. I remember growing up, I was nervous about Jesus coming back. Anybody else, you're like, oh my gosh, when's he coming back? I'm kinda scared. No, 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 the first thing we need to know is that Jesus is coming back, so be encouraged. Like as believers, as people that profess a faith in Jesus, we, we should be encouraged. And if, if you're not encouraged, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're gonna settle that in about 24 minutes and 51 seconds. And we can be all on the same page and we can leave here encouraged encouraged by our relationship with Jesus, encouraged that he is coming back. Here's what it looks like. I'm a father of two right now. Bentley is seven, Kingston is three. And my boys, like when daddy comes back home, like they are encouraged. I am the hero of the house right now. When I open the door from the garage, it is a full sprint from the living room. Bentley comes around the turn and then Kingston's three and he's got sock feet most of the time and he can't quite make the turn. It usually ends in a face plant or into the wall. Pray for him and for us. If you've heard Kingston stories, we just need your prayers in Jesus' name. But they always run to the door. They're like, Daddy's home. And Kingston always says something like, Daddy, you wanna play with me? Like, you play with me now? We're going upstairs, we're going outside, and we're going in the pool. They are so excited. When Daddy comes back home, like, when I walk in the door, they are so encouraged. They are so excited. I just pretend 10, 12 years from now, knowing what I did in my teenage years, that if dad came home unexpected, <laughs> it wasn't like, dad, I'm so glad you're here. It's like, dad, what, what are you doing home right now? Where did you come from? I wish you would have told me. It didn't really bring encouragement, it, it brought panic. <laughs> why are you here? Why, why, are, why are these people here? I didn't invite them over, how did they get here? Jesus is coming back, and if we have a relationship with him and our life is in order, it should bring encouragement. He's coming back. Be encouraged. Hey, church, if you're going through something tough today, if you're going through one of the worst seasons of your life, maybe in your marriage, maybe in a relationship, maybe somebody has hurt you, can I just encourage you today that Jesus is coming back? And what's going on right now is that what the Bible calls a light and momentary trouble. There's... No place from now on, if you have a relationship with Jesus, we just read, he's always gonna be there. Regardless of how heavy that load may feel, regardless of how painful it may be. I thought about this week, that all of your pain, all of the stress, all of those tough seasons, 
They have an expiration date. And when Jesus comes back, he's gonna make it all right. And there's more to this life than just this life. And later is so much longer than, than now. And eternity is coming. If you're going through something tough, just put one foot in front of the other. Like we talked about earlier, pray and praise and look to the sky and look forward to the day that Jesus returns. Take encouragement from that. I want to hit the other person sitting in the seats that you've got it all together. And you're tucked in, you're buttoned up, and business is good, and family is good, and you're looking around, and you're playing this Jesus game. You come here on Sunday, and put a little tip in the offering bucket, and how you doing, Pastor? Good to see you. But you've got it all under control. You're building something for yourself. Hey, sir, ma'am, eternity's coming. And your success has an expiration date. The things of this world will pass away. And are we storing up things for here and now? or for later. When Jesus comes back, I wanna be full of stories and full of stuff that gets to go with me, and that's making a difference in people's lives. Jesus coming back, be encouraged. The second thing, let's go back to our Bibles for just a moment. The second thing, in 1 Thessalonians, let's drop down to chapter five. Jesus is coming back, so we need to, to do some things differently. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, this is so important, you are not in the darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. We shouldn't be surprised by it, church. Jesus coming back, we need to be encouraged. Secondly, Jesus coming back, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. Like I just gave you the answers to the test. It's true or false. It's yes or no. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If so, be encouraged. And now you're prepared for the test. What are you gonna do with your life now that you know what's on the test? Be prepared. Here's what it looks like. I was going to lunch this week. I was studying and I walking out of my office and I saw Pastor Jay uh, in his office working and, uh, and I was like, man, I should go to lunch with Jay. I knocked on his door. We were walking outside and, and, uh, and come to think of it, it was just me and you, Jay. I'm not real sure where everybody else was on Tuesday. We should fire them, I guess. Um, if you're looking for a job, theactionchurch.com. So Jay and I were the only two going to lunch apparently. Apparently everybody else takes a four hour lunch break at Action Church and so we're going to lunch and I kind of surprised Jay, and so it wasn't on the calendar. I was like, Jay, let's go grab something to eat. And I have this phrase that I'm kind of famous for because I hate to drive. I say, I'll, uh, uh, you drive, I'll buy. Like that's, that's, anytime I ask you to lunch, you drive, I'll buy. That sounds very generous, but we usually just go to McDonald's and get a dollar menu. It's not that generous. You're actually putting more damage on your car. I'm just kidding, I don't eat at McDonald's. But where you drive, I'll buy. And we're walking down the steps and you should have seen the look of panic on Jay's face when I said, you drive, I'll buy. He's like, my, my car, my car. And he's had that look of panic that we all have when your boss or somebody that you're trying to impress, you show up somewhere, you're like, you wanna ride together? And you're like, no. <laughs> Nobody should see what's in my car. You can tell what I've eaten for the last 37 days. <laughs> Starbucks called and wants to recycle just the cups in my car to save a forest. And the look of panic, he was like, I'm gonna need a second. Like, I'm gonna need a minute. I was like, that's great, because I gotta go to the restroom, you go clean out the car, and I'll, I'll go to the restroom. I get out there, his car is spotless. It's like he had a mobile detailing company come out and clean it. God knows I did not wanna see the trunk. You know what I mean? Like, who, the trunk is gonna have to be replaced, I'm sure, after our lunch meeting. And I get in there, and, and, and it's spotless. But what would have happened, church, if I, if, if I wouldn't have had to go to the restroom? What would have happened, church, if he didn't have time to prepare? There's gonna be a moment. And if you don't get it now, some of you are gonna miss it. And, and that moment's gonna happen and the, the skies are gonna open up and people around you are gonna be rejoicing and you're gonna be thinking, I wish I had a few moments just to clean up a little bit. Like, I just wish I had a few moments. If I would have known, if I would have prepared, then I would have been ready for this return. I'm telling you today, the time to start preparing is now. It's right now. Jesus is coming back, be encouraged. Jesus is coming back, be prepared. Thirdly, 
Jesus is coming back, be focused. Be focused on the right things. Here's what it says in the next couple of verses of 1 Thessalonians about our focus. It says, for you are all children of light. You're children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and sober, clearly thinking, focused on the right things, ready for what God wants us to do. If Jesus is returning, church, we need to be focused on the right things. And that's focused on growing closer to him. The Bible says, love the Lord your God and love, love, love others as you love yourself. We talked about that last week. The only thing worth fighting for is fighting for people that don't know Jesus to come into a relationship with him, fighting for people that are disconnected to reconnect. Are we fighting the right fight in loving people? I'm talking about love for just a while. How do we love somebody? Really answering the question, how do we stand out? Culture shifting, how do we stand out like Daniel did, but still help out in the process? We, we gotta love people. You know, love is the, the tone in which we operate. Love is the motive by which we, we do things, which if you're married in here, you know that's really important. I didn't realize how important tone of voice was <laughs> until I get married. You're saying it right, but it's the wrong tone. Oh, okay, please tell me, how, what, what, what? I need a video camera of all of my confrontation at home. I need to go back, watch some film. Oh, that's what you're talking about. Guys, we're stupid, right? Like we just don't know. Like we say it, we're like, what, I said it right? No. And I need you to know that what we do and how we live, we're gonna talk about in just a moment, that without love, we're just approaching the world, we're approaching culture with the wrong tone. And they're not hearing us because we're not saying it the right way. They're not hearing us because we're not treating them the right way. We need to love people. Let's look in our Bibles in 1 Corinthians 13, just for a moment. 1 Corinthians 13, I wanna walk through just a couple of verses with you, talking about what love looks like and what our life looks like without love. If you're, if you're taking notes, write these, this brief list down, that without love, let's put it on the screen for them, without love, all I say is ineffective. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, that's pretty cool, like if I speak like the angels do, that sounds pretty awesome, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, that you can, you can say the right things, but if the tone is wrong, if the motive is wrong, if the motive, church, is to correct people, you're doing it wrong. The motive, what we say, or the motive, or the tone should be to connect with them first, so then, through a relationship, we can correct them on the backside. That if we're lo looking to love people, we're gonna say the right things out of the right motive. Secondly, without love, all I know is insignificant. This one kind of threw me off a little bit. Here's what Paul says. It says, and if I have prophetic powers, that's pretty cool, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, like all of them. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm not super smart, but we got some really smart people on our staff, like Pastor Joseph and Pastor Tyler, they got de degrees all over the office, and they like to remind me of them all the time. Look at them, they're just everywhere. They're so smart, they're brilliant people. Everything they know, everything you know, everything we all know together, like all knowledge and all understanding, it says without love is nothing. That all that I know is just, it's just insignificant, it doesn't matter. John Maxwell says it doesn't matter how much you know if people don't know that you actually care about them. All I know is insignificant. Next, without love, all I believe is insufficient. And this challenged my theology a little bit, just to be honest. Like, I can believe the right things. I can believe that Jesus died for me. I can believe that he's coming again. But if I don't love him, if I don't love other people, all I believe is insufficient. The Bible clearly states that even the demons in hell believe in Jesus. It tells me belief is not enough, that my belief has to transform something on the inside of me the Holy Spirit has to change some things and I have to love God and love people that my belief should turn into love in action. The fourth one, without love, all I give is incomplete. All I give is incomplete. It says this in verse three, it says, uh, if I if understand all mysteries, I have all the faith to remove mountains, I have nothing. If I give away all that I have, not just do I tithe, not just do I, am I generous, like all of it. 
Like if I give it all away, but it's not for the right reasons, if it's for notoriety, if it's for, for people to see, hey church, if it's for things that aren't gonna matter in eternity, like I love helping people. We talked about it last week. If we're not helping them see Jesus more clearly, it's a waste. That all I give away is incomplete if it's not true love, which is telling people that the love of Jesus can change their life. All I give is incomplete. And then lastly, wrap it all up. All I accomplish is inadequate. That everything that I do, Paul says this, and finishing out three and four, if I give all the way that I have, if I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Goes on to say love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. We live in a society that loves justice and revenge, but love endures all things, bears all things. Can I just tell you, a lot of times when people mistreat me, I wanna give them back what I think that they deserve. But Paul's clearly telling us that if we truly love God and love people, we shouldn't repay evil for evil, we should endure it. We should accept it. We should allow it to make us better and then, and then treat people differently than they're treating us. How do we stand out and help out we love people? What does that look like practically? Let's get practical for our last few moments together. We've gotta do this thing the Bible talks about is this kind of this, this tug of war, this, this kind of two-step, this dance routine, this tension to manage of walking in grace and in truth. That to love people, we've gotta show them grace, but we've also gotta give them the truth. John chapter one says this, as the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth full of grace and truth, that we are going to connect with people. Here's, if you missed last week, to sum it all up, we're, we're, we're fighting the wrong fight. We're fighting to be right instead of fighting to reach people. Like we're just fighting to win the argument. And if you, if you notice, back to the marriage, have you noticed that you're 100% right and completely wrong? You ever noticed that before? Mostly guys in the room. You ever notice that? You come in and you got, you got everything, like, because your wife can remember like seven months. You do your best to remember the last seven minutes, but you've got the list. You know what I mean? You're like, I'm right, and I'm gonna prove a point. And about 30 seconds you're in, you're like, no, I'm, how am I wrong? <laughs> I was expecting a tearful apology and let's make up later. You know what I mean? And that, <laughs> and I ended like doing dishes and sleeping alone. Like, I am really confused. And we fight to be right, and I can just tell you, you could be theologically correct, and you could be right in what you're pointing out, but if you lose relationship, you're completely wrong. We can't beat people up with the truth. <laughs> we can't. Can I also tell you something? We can't change the truth. That's why it's truth and grace. We can't discount it. We're in a society that in the name of love, we've just discounted truth. We can't. We can't, as human beings, say that we know what love is more than God does. The God, I know, I know you created all this, <laughs> and everything's from you and returning to you, but, but hey, in this situation, I'm gonna choose to love and telling somebody that's not, telling somebody something that's not in the Bible or that is in the Bible that you say, no, that doesn't really apply, that's not love. That's a lie. So we gotta give truth and grace. Because without truth, church, with, without walking in truth, we're gonna miss some things. Because truth is God's standard. You need to know that today. Truth is God's standard. But grace is God's favor. And I love his truth. Like, I love it. It, it shows us, if you read the Old Testament, that, that, that God's truth, that his holiness, that his law, we couldn't measure up. Like, on your best day, you fell short. But that's the standard. And when we knew that we couldn't measure up to the standard, he gave us his grace on the cross in the form of Jesus Christ, and that's his favor. 
Ephesians says that salvation is not through what we can do, through our good works, but in Christ alone so that no one could boast about it. You need to know that grace is God's favor. So we need truth because we need to know what the standard is, but we need grace because we need the favor of God. Like, we, like, like you need it. I think in the church we think they need it. Like God died for sinners like you. No, God died for sinners like me. Like I remember who I was and I remember who I am like this week. Like I know what goes on in my head and I know what I struggle with. I need the grace of God. And if you're walking, if you're walking in truth, one day you're gonna be judged by truth. And I don't wanna be judged by truth. So I'm gonna walk in grace. Because I know what I've been forgiven. And I know that I need to extend that same forgiveness to other people. But without truth, we gotta have it in our life. Without some truth, we are corrupt. We're corrupt. Like without a standard, we don't know where to go. Anybody ever been lost before, like lost like before uh, Google Maps? Like you were back, maybe you were back like camping back in the day or you were out on a hiking trail and you had what they called a compass. Remember that? Like I'm 33, I'm not real sure. I know, still know how to find north. Like but I know once you find north, like you're good to go. But without it, you're just walking around in a circle. Hey church, stop walking around in a circle. You have true north, it's called the word of God. Read it, it's his standard, it shows you where to go and once you find your standard, you know which steps to take. Without truth, we're corrupt. But without grace, man, without grace, we're condemned. We're condemned. We've talked around it all day. You need to stop believing the 51% gospel that you can do just enough good to get to heaven. That if my good outweighs my bad, God's gonna let me in. It's not. The Bible is clear. There's no way to the Father but through the Son. That many will come to God on that day and say, I did this and I did that, and they'll make a list of their accomplishments, and God will say to them very bluntly, depart from me, for I never knew you. Without Truth, we're corrupt. Without grace, we're condemned. Last thing I wanna tell you today about truth and grace. Without truth, we become worldly. And I think my, my favorite line from last week is that we can't make a difference if we're not different. And if we look like the world and we talk like the world and our marriages look like the world and, and our, our kids look like the world and our businesses are shady like the world and our customer service is like the world and our language is like the world and we, we, our habits are like the world, if we look the same, how can we ever stand out enough so that people can say, no, you're different? And I like the results. We read last week, we don't light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. Some of you need to remove the bowl of worldliness from your life, the, the shadow that you cast over by looking the same and shine brightly for the world to see by being different. Without truth that we're gonna be worldly, but without grace, we're gonna become judgmental. If there's anything that I hate more than a worldly Christian, it's a judgmental Christian. They're not fun people. You know what I mean? You're not inviting them over. Like, hey, I'm watching the game. Come over and criticize all the commercials. You know what I mean? Like, it'd be awesome. Come talk about it about everybody that we are friends with. That'd be really great. Just judging everybody. And here's what judgmental people do. They judge people that sin differently than them. Because we've all got it. If you don't got it, then you're Jesus. And I'd love to meet you after service. <laughs> like on the bucket list. But we say, you can't do that. And in the church, we love it. We, we put some sins outside the church, but we sit next to some sins and snuggle up and say, yeah, I'm struggling with that too. No, all sin separates us from God. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need a savior, we need grace, because if we don't have grace, if we don't remember every single day, church, what we've been forgiven, we'll begin to look at people and say, why are you acting like that? But if we just remembered where we were, we'd say, oh, I know why, because we're all, one step away from stupid. <laughs> and I'm just gonna come alongside you and help you stay away from it. Jesus modeled this, we'll close with this. Jesus modeled this in John chapter eight. Remember the story, maybe you've heard it before, the woman's caught in adultery, right? And so Jesus is preaching, 
he's living his calling, he's, he's doing everything he's supposed to be doing, and, and people are getting saved, people are getting healed, he's in this moment. And then the religious leaders of the day, the judgmental, the, the people that just love the truth and know grace, they catch this woman in adultery and they bring her and they throw her before the crowd. First of all, highly inappropriate. Like the Bible says caught in adultery, and I'm not trying to be graphic, I'm just trying to say how inappropriate our, our, our judgmental nature and how lack of common sense it would be. We caught you in adultery and we're just throwing you into a crowd. Secondly, how did the religious leaders know where somebody committing adultery was? Like you just play that out for a second. I haven't caught very many people in the act of adultery. Never, never been in a place to catch somebody. Where were they? Why were they there? Just some things that I'm thinking about as I'm reading this story about these religious leaders. But they throw her out there and they say, they say, Jesus, what should we do with this woman? We caught her in the act of adultery. <laughs> Maybe one more thought, where's the guy? Like they say, the law would demand that she be stoned to death. But like it took two to get there, like where's the other one? Because he it doesn't make sense. We start judging people that sin differently. We start calling out other people's sin. We'll lose rationalization and we'll lose common sense and we'll just try and get them caught. And we'll realize that we just let somebody off the hook and we just threw a half naked woman in front of a crowd of men, women, and children. We just, it's crazy. It's one of my favorite stories in scripture. Jesus models this truth and grace so beautifully. He begins to have this conversation with the guys and he said, okay, accusers, all of you guys, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says he begins to write in the dirt. And I just love to kind of think about what he could have been writing. Some scholars believe he was writing down the law. He was writing down the 10 commandments to remind these guys to try and capture their hearts and their minds saying, hey, this is the law and, and if you can keep all of it, go ahead. Like you go ahead and cast a stone. He was reminding them of where they fall short. And he would have gotten to the one that says, do not commit adultery. And he's already taught that adultery is not just physical, it could be mental as well, what you think about. And he was reminding them that they fall short. There's another version that I really like a lot better. I believe that there's the version that he was just bending down, and this is, this is the Jesus. Like, this is like the Ricky Bobby Jesus. You know what I'm talking about, where you're just picturing him with a little tuxedo T-shirt. It's formal, but he's here to party. I just like, I like this Jesus, because it's funnier and it, you weren't there and so you can't tell me it's wrong. I like to picture that he was bending down in the sand and I would get all the way down but my pants are too tight. So I'm gonna get right here. I don't need the email, they're fine. And I believe he was just writing the names of the mistresses of the men that were in a place to find someone adultery. Like he was like, Jennifer. You remember her? Sally. And the Bible says that from the oldest to the youngest, they dropped their stones. And one by one, they walked away. And here's one of the most beautiful pictures of what a relationship with Jesus Christ really is. He looks at this woman, full of sin, shame. Can you imagine the regret? Nobody ends up there on purpose. What pain took her to that moment? Jesus, understanding that, says, woman, where are your accusers? She looks around, there's nobody there. He says, there's nobody here. Nobody here to condemn you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He met her right where she was. No condemnation. I don't need to clarify what the sin was. We all know. And you need to know that you don't have to rationalize or clarify. Jesus knows. And he's meeting her there and he's meeting you there today and saying, I'm not gonna condemn you. I'm gonna give you grace. The thing that you don't deserve. You can't understand this and you can't earn it. I'm just gonna give it to you. Meeting us right where we are, loving us enough to come to us, to bend down and say, neither do I condemn you. But this is not a gospel of cheap grace or a license to, to sin. 
He speaks clearly. He says, go and sin no more. Grace, truth. God's standard and his favor. Who are you when culture shifts? What are we gonna look like? I hope we are individuals and families and a church that fights the right fight to show grace and truth, to care enough to bend down to the darkest situations and say, that's not who you are. I'm not gonna accuse you. I'm not gonna call you by your mistake. I'm gonna call you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I can't fix you, and I can't, I, I can't correct you, but I know someone that can. And if you will make Jesus Lord of your life, and you invite the Holy Spirit to empower you, we can literally see you walk away from this moment and sin no more and begin to walk the path God has for you. Let's be that church that walks in grace and in truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed, all of our locations. God, we love you so much. God, I thank you for this message. I thank you for these six weeks, God, of just opening up our hearts to some challenging topics. God, I thank you so much for the sermons and the reminders and the Psalms that we read that just make us feel so full of life and so inspired. But God, I thank you for messages like we find in Daniel that really stir up some conflict on the inside of us, that really convict us to live differently. God, I pray as a church we'd walk out of these six weeks different in the name of Jesus, that culture will shift, but we're gonna stand firm and we're gonna love people well in Jesus' name. Church, every head bowed, every eye closed. Just a few more moments. Some of you are not encouraged by Jesus' return. You're not prepared and you're not focused on the right things, but the good news of the gospel is that he died in your place. He died for you and you are one decision away. You are one heartfelt moment away from everything changing. I wanna give you that opportunity today. Maybe it's for the first time in here, you've heard the gospel presented clearly today. And you're gonna raise your hand and pray a prayer. And today is the day of your salvation. Maybe you're in here today at one of our locations and you're just like me at 19 years old. You knew all the right answers, but you were waiting. You were struggling. You wanted to kind of battle for control. And today is the day you lay your life down, surrender your life, and recommit your future to Jesus Christ. So for the first time, or maybe for the first time, in a long time, at all of our locations. Would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you? I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to recommit my life. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, all of our locations, raise them high. Locations are taking their service right now. Winter Springs, anybody else before we pray? I'm gonna join the few this morning and say, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. So proud of you. It's an amazing decision. You put your hands down. Would you pray this prayer in your heart as I pray it out loud? Say something like this. Say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner saved only by your grace. And I'm confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart that you are the Lord. And I'm giving you that place today, complete and total control. God, have your way in my life. Thank you for saving me. Now, God, I pray for all of us. Let us leave here today changed. Let us find our identity in you and never waver. Let us walk faithfully, meeting people this week. God, I pray for practical ways this week. Don't make it easy on us. Make it tough on us. Let us, let us walk into situations in our workplace, at Starbucks, at Publix, in our families. Give us opportunities to meet people and to walk in grace and in truth. In Jesus' name, we love you. We praise you for all you've done. It's your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Church, can we celebrate the five or six hands?